Weisgold has been CIA's Deputy Director for Analysis since March of 2020. Now, in that role, she's responsible for the quality of all source intelligence analysis at the CIA and for the professional development of the officers who help produce that. Since joining CIA in 1986, Linda has been part of the creation and delivery of intelligence analysis, really in a variety of complex issues and in multiple settings. We're gonna get a little bit into that in just a moment. Before the 9-11 terrorist attacks, she was an analyst and leader of analytic programs that were focused on the Middle East. And Linda, I'm just gonna keep bragging on you for one more minute here. Uh, immediately after that, you were among those who volunteered for counterterrorism assignments. The units that you guided included CIA's Office of Terrorism Analysis. They generated insights that informed US policy and operations really across multiple administrations. And for more than two years, you served as a presidential intelligence briefer. You're very experienced in the coverage of urgent, controversial issues. And uh, you also are a teacher and champion of analytic tradecraft. I am so eager to dig into like how you think and what is in your mind. <laughs> Welcome, first of all, to the Cypher Brief Studio. Suzanne, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate uh, being here. I think this is gonna be fun today. I think it is going to be fun. Um, I thought we might start off with kind of a big question for you. You know, today's world is incredibly complicated. I really want to know how the CIA even begins to think about understanding it all. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, when I looked at the title for today's event and um, we talked about an increasingly complex world, I, I don't think we are, that, that's not hyperbole. Um, you know, it, we really are, I think, in a transformative moment. Uh, right now um, on the global stage. So today's world is more complicated. It is more crowded and competitive um, than I've ever seen uh, during, as you said, my almost four decades working at the agency. Um, and that presents both some real challenges and some real um, opportunities for intelligence analysts and how we think about things and what we do. Um, just to talk for a second about why it's more complex, uh, it really, I think at this point, what we can say is that America's position um, at the head of the table is no longer guaranteed. Um, what we've seen is that China is not just content to have a seat at the table. Um, President Xi wants to actually be at the head of the table. And, um, you know, there are declining powers like Russia that I think the war in Ukraine has shown probably rather than give up more power, would want to upend the table altogether at this point. Uh, and then you have a bunch of countries that are caught in the middle, whether it's um, you know Middle East, Africa, Latin America, that are really trying to hedge their bets and are trying to uh, preserve their ties without uh, alienating rival powers. So, you know, helping our policymakers through all of those dynamics would be hard enough uh, for CIA analysts, but we're also contending more and more with uh, some really important uh, transnational issues, things like climate change, food insecurity, migration, um, counter narcotics issues, uh, global health. Um, and so, you know, that's taking up more and more of our time. We can't take our eyes off the ball on terrorism. And then you throw in really the unprecedented technological change that is happening um, in our world. Uh, and really that's reshaping both the substance and the, the process of how we do our analysis. So kind of getting to your question about, you know, how does an analyst think about all of that? I think it's really important um, to maybe help our, our listeners today uh, understand a little bit about what we do and we don't do as intelligence analysts, um, because trying to frame that. So, you know, really at the heart of our analytic mission at CIA, um, is to deliver objective assessments about the world to some of the most important and busiest people in, that, in the world. Um, and we're not trying to make that complex world I just described simple. What we're trying to do is make it understandable, um, to give those that we serve, including the president, um, new ways to think about dangers and opportunities around the globe, whether the topic's an enduring one, an emerging one, or you know, something that's over the horizon. And sometimes those are the hardest ones to get people to pay attention to because it's not right on their immediate calendar. But what we try and do is to go beyond what's happening to examine why it's happening. Um, we provide historical context, we highlight motives and variables, and we sketch out 
scenarios. As I said, we discuss impl uh, implications for all of that. And then we identify potential points of leverage that our policymakers and decision makers can use if they so choose to. Uh, it's really important to make sure that folks understand that um, analysts, particularly at CIA, our job is not to make policy, our job is to inform policy. Um, and some might think that's a limitation, uh, but for us, we actually think that this is, there's power in that because if we can objectively inform, then we have um, a better chance, I think, of people listening um, to us. So, you know, I think this last point, I would say it's, you know, how we do our jobs, um, it sets us apart from the media and think tanks, as important as those organizations are. Um, because unlike them, we rely on three privileged, um, I, I guess three points of privileged access is the way mm -hmm. I would put it. Um, we rely on access to the time and the thinking um, and the goals of our country's leaders. So this helps us understand what they need to know and when they need to know it. Um, you mentioned earlier a little bit, you know, kind of people who have been received the president's daily brief. Putting together, and that was part of my responsibility for um, both having briefed it to the president, but also to the last several years, being the one who helped set what was going to go into that um, briefing every morning. You know, knowing what's on there, what they're dealing with is very important. Uh, the second thing is access to a vast range of information, uh, be it classified and unclassified, um, and that's you know often acquired at great risk and cost. So, but it gives us the raw material. Um, to evaluate for our analysis. It's really kind of a big sandbox in which we can develop insights. And the last thing I'll just say is that it's the access to CIA's reputation. Um, mm -hmm. We This gets us a place at the interagency table and the opportunity to be heard. And we have to be mindful every day about that reputation. Um, so I think I'll stop there um, and then we can maybe go on after. Uh, you've seen some amazing things in the course of your career, but I think it's really interesting when you came in um, to your last role at CIA as a deputy director for analysis, uh, March 2020, yeah. and, and you talked about uh, some of the over the horizon things, and sometimes it's difficult to get people to focus on those. I would say COVID might fall into that category. I'm wondering, I mean, because you, you know, it was like, right as a, at your welcoming committee at the door was a global pandemic. How have you seen sort of the, the gathering in intelligence, the analysis, um, the sharing of intelligence change given what COVID did in terms of sending people home, not allowing access, um, dramatic shifts in how we're using technology to understand the world around us? What were some of the significant, significant changes that you saw during that time? Um, you're right. So taking over right at the beginning of uh, COVID, there were there were a lot of challenges involved in that um, from both the managing a work, the workforce um, and then also, as you said, kind of delivering information to policymakers. Um, during that time, we should also can't forget that, you know, so the entire time in 2020, uh, we had um, also a new administration coming in um, and it's always difficult when you have new administrations uh, because you are still serving one administration and you are preparing another. And I kept I kept threatening that I was going to get a t-shirt that had 50% on any given day. I only had 50% of people in the, in the office or, or working because that was how CIA chose to um, work through uh, the pandemic was in order to create greater space because we couldn't work from home. Um, classified information, folks couldn't, couldn't do it from there. Uh, what we did was to kind of go to a, a week on week off schedule for quite some time. So we thinned out people in the building and be able to be able to give people more space. Um, but backing up, I would say one of the things that really helped us was that we had already been anticipating um, not the global pandemic, but the idea that we would have to look at how we do our work differently. And that's part of uh, was part of my job as well as deputy director for analysis was to be making sure we were always ready, ready for the next big thing. Um, so for example, we had already, from a workforce perspective, um, had already set up um, ways in which we could figure, find out what people's expertise was, even if they weren't working on that account. Um, so that we had an ability to know that maybe even before you came to CIA, 
you, you know, you worked on a particular issue or you spoke languages that you weren't using now. And we could tap into those, that expertise um, on your week you were there because we didn't have someone necessarily who spoke a particular language. Um, on. So we had already set up some kind of systems along those ways to, to understand um, our, our expertise. We had set up knowledge management tools um, in which we could quickly go through and have people follow what the analytic lines were and how they change over time so that when people had been out for a while, if they came back in, they could track what had been happening, see where our analysis had been, what we had been saying. So we, we were using a lot of things that we already had developed. Um, so that would be one thing I would say. On the other side, um, as you said, the policymaker, uh, it is always hard to get a policymaker's attention um, on something that isn't right on their, uh, I call it making them eat their vegetables, because it's not the kind of thing that they are having to pay attention to today. There's not a something on their agenda. It may happen outside the, you know, the terms of their term. Um, and so, but you have to say, look, you need to make a decision today on this because if you don't 10 years from now, there's going to potentially be something bad that happens. Getting folks to focus on that um, is something that we had to do a lot of during the pandemic as well, because we were looking at this idea of, okay, um, what is the law, what are the long-term effects of the pandemic? What does this mean for uh, China's economy? What does it mean for our own economy? and how we're going to be able to our own budgets, all kinds of things, and how we're going to be able to um, maintain leverage and power across the globe. So yeah, there's a lot that we um, had to look forward, continue to try and look ahead, um, but doing it with half the, half the people. And I am blessed to have had uh, CIA's officers are uh, truly mission focused. Um, it's one of the reasons it's, you know, people often ask me why I stayed for almost 40 years. Uh, and it was the mission, but it was also the people. Um, they are amazing in their ability to uh, to stay on mission uh, despite everything going on around them. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot going on uh, in the last couple yeah. of years. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I want to start to get to some of these, um, even though I've got other ones um, that I want to ask, but I'm not going to be completely greedy. Um, Larry Pfeiffer. Larry, I kind of had a feeling the first question might come from you today. So hello to Larry. Uh, it's nice to have you with us. He'd like to know, Linda, how do you anticipate AI capabilities such uh, such as provided publicly by ChatGPT affecting CIA's analytic tradecraft? And what worries you about AI? And I think we actually have a couple of questions uh, on that very same topic. So I'm eager to hear what you have to say about that. Um, absolutely. So a, a quick story. I, I did. Um, I've said previously that I did not think that AI was going to be replacing CIA analysts anytime soon. And that was the first time I said that on a, a, a different podcast. And the next day I heard myself on the radio. Um, that, that has been what, what was picked up. I almost drove off the road because I'm not really used to being um, heard uh, on the radio or, or publicly, uh, but I was really popular with the analysts that day when I came in. Um, so the reason that I say that I don't think it's gonna replace um, CIA analysts anytime soon is because one of the key things that differentiates how we do our work, again, from think tanks and the media, we have to be very clear about why we think what we think. We have to be able to explain that. Um, and it, I don't think it's going to be a satisfactory answer to any president of the United States for CIA to come in and say, well, an algorithm that I don't understand because it's proprietary, um, says so. Uh, so we need to be able to say why we think what we think. Um, but AI, I think, is going to be both the tool that we will use, and we already have been using AI um, at CIA for quite some time. Uh, we've developed some of our own. Um, it's also they're going to make our lives more complicated. Um, deception is going to be even harder to uncover, I think, in a world in which people have access to AI. Um, another reason I don't think that AI is going to replace us is I think folks are already starting to see as more and more people test AI. It's as a large language model, it's going to give you inaccurate answers at times. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't know whether what it's saying to you is actually correct. It just knows that that is what a lot of people have said. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, it doesn't have that expertise to be testing itself. 
um, which is again part of what I think our analysts do. So I look at AI as both it's going to be a tool that we'll use in the future and it's also going to be something that we're going to have to be able to um, identify and uncover when it's being used against us. Yeah, and it, its accuracy is a great a great point and something a lot of people are talking about. We did a just a fun little uh, chat GPT uh, on Brad Christian and it came back that Brad Christian worked at the Cypher Brief and he was a former Navy SEAL, which is fine if you're a former Navy SEAL, but being a former Green Beret, yes. it so well. So uh, there, there are little issues there that need to be ironed out, but I can imagine, I mean, something that simple on a more serious note when you're doing what you are doing in breaking but policy. Even, even, really even, I said earlier that um, our reputation is so important. If, uh, a quick little story. It wasn't from um, AI, but it, it does get to kind of that idea of accuracy of what we do and how important it is. So one day when I was briefing President Bush, um, I walked in and before I could start my brief, he stopped me and he, he asked the question. Um, he, he was a little upset um, because he had just had a protocol visit. He had a state visit with someone and he had given them as a protocol gift a bowling ball um engraved and whatever and that world leader looked at him and said but i don't bowl and so he was embarrassed and he asked uh, his staff why did you have me give this guy a bowling ball and they said because cia said he was an avid bowler oh, wow. in his leadership profile um so get the president of the united states first thing in the morning looking at you and saying why the hell did you say that and yeah. so getting back to what is really the bedrock for us, which is that trade craft of being able to say why you said what you said. I went back to the building. For, first off, the best answer for anything like that to a president, don't ever try and bullshit it, is, you know, I don't know, sir, but I'll find out. Um, so I went back that morning and sure enough, our folks had, had done their trade craft. They knew why they said what they said. And it was on this world leader's official campaign website when he was running for office. He said he was an avid bowler. Uh -huh. um, not only that, he was president of his local bowling league. There were all kinds of things on his website. I think he was trying to be a man of the people. So, wow. you know, the fact that I was able to go back the next day and tell the president that, you know, here's why we said it. And also, don't worry, we added to his profile that he's not gracious. Wow. Um, that, but if I couldn't do that, um, if I had to go back and just say, I don't know, chat GPT told me, yeah. um, that wouldn't work. I think that's a wonderful story to share, and and I can honestly just imagine what that moment must have been like for you, and and the way that you got out of that. I, I also think the lesson learned there is that what you read on someone's campaign page, uh, who knows if they're going to actually be that person in office, right? It, it, is one of the, it is one of the things when you're talking about in a world where we're increasingly seeing you know disinformation and misinformation, that part of the way getting back to your very first question of how CIA analysts do their work. Uh, we are, by nature, I think, uh, a group of skeptics, right? You look at everything with a skeptical eye. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, you have to be open to the idea that the way you think about the world and what you've been thinking could be wrong. Mm -hmm. So probably the most important question that our analysts have to ask themselves every day is, how might I be wrong? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And some of it may be just because it's on the website, that doesn't mean it's true. It's an incredibly difficult job. I mean, I, I can just imagine, you know, most of us make mistakes in our daily work and, and it's not pointed out by 27,000 other people. Uh, you don't get that privilege uh, working at CIA doing what you do. Let and most, up, uh, most days we also don't get to defend ourselves afterwards, so. Right, which is another drawback, but <laughs> the things people give up for the mission. Um, right. Jeff Hahn, he's with Palantir. He's got a great question. You answered a portion of it already, but I want to pick up on the second half of it. He says, obviously, these large language models like ChatGPT GPT are never going to replace analysts who are writing the PDB. But he wants to know if you can talk a little bit more about how you're thinking that they could be helpful to intelligence analysis tradecraft. And he says, for instance, could they be used to discover information that's been ignored, come up with competing hypotheses, draft red teaming arguments, or do sort of initial drafts of situation reports that require maybe less analytic thinking? Absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, we're already using uh, some AI uh, at, at the agency, and one of them is exactly the, the case that was just laid out to find information that perhaps we hadn't seen. You know, yeah. analysts these days are swimming in oceans of information. Um, I, I sometimes would tell the story that when I started, 
Um, you could actually hit next doc on your computer and there wasn't one. Like you had read your mail for the day. And I know that, you know, our analysts today can't even conceive of that. Yeah. Um, so we had already designed something I like to call it kind of the Amazon effect, but we had designed some AI that was um, looking at, uh, analysts could say, here, I've written this paper and here's the sources that I've used for it and run it with the machine and have the AI check and say, you know what? It's kind of like the, I call it the Amazon effect. because it's like, hey, you've been looking at these purses. Maybe you'd like these shoes. Yeah. Hey, you've read these and use these sources. These things over here seem like something you might be interested in. Did yeah. you see these? So again, we are looking and, and kind of testing and coordinating, if you will, with the machine. Um, I can also envision AI, uh, something like a, a chat GPT, helping us on. There are some countries, you know, we continue to have global coverage responsibilities at CIA, but there are some where we can't spend as much time looking at them. Mm -hmm. um, so having something where you have an analyst who can check in every once in a while or have the machine alert you when mm -hmm. something has happened on that country, if you set up parameters. And again, we've been looking and, and have been working through those kinds of models as well. Um, and so I could envision a lot of ways in which um, AI will be able to help the analysts. I love the idea of red teaming um, or, you know, I'm a little less enthralled by the idea of having it um, do the initial draft mm -hmm. because, but again, part of, I think what's going to be so important is what's the prompt that is used with the AI? Because mm -hmm. for us, when you're coming up with an um, analysis, one of the most important parts at the beginning is what is the key intelligence question you're trying to answer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, you don't know what that answer is going to be, but forming that question is really important. Um, and so forming that question for, you know, the AI will be really important. You have to see what happens, how it comes, you know, what they would come up with. Yeah. Because once you do that, it's, it's hard. Whatever you get as the basis, it's really hard to change it. You can mm -hmm. evolve it a little bit, um, but it's, I would prefer to see analysts kind of taking that first rough draft. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie Helm asks, what's your strategy to validate information? Like she brings up deep fakes and intentional disinformation campaigns seem to be making it really difficult to verify sources and materials. Denial and deception is age old, but it, it seems the problem is even tougher today. Do you agree? I do. Um, and so, you know, some of this I think is going to be, we're going to have to develop our own technological technological responses mm -hmm. to help us figure out and identify deep fakes and others. But some of this is, is part of the trade craft that we use already. So um, I believe very strongly that uh, coordination and real debate um, is a, a key part of uncovering um, misinformation even today. So mm -hmm. when an analyst at CIA um, writes a, a piece that they believe is going to go to the policymaker, um, it starts out as an individual product, but it ends as a corporate one. And by mm -hmm. that, I mean, by the time it is done, it has been tested through their team um, and, you know, debated. It's been, depending on who the customer is, if it's going to the president, it has gone to other parts of the intelligence community for them to weigh in and debate and ask questions. And what about this? Did you see this? Did you consider maybe that video was a deep fake? And, you know, we have information over here. And so it really gets tested and vetted um, as best we can. And then the other part of it is it's really key for us to make sure that we tell policymakers our level of confidence in what we're saying. Mm -hmm. So in addition to telling them about, you know, why we think what we think, we have to tell them how sure we are about it. And this is really one of the big lessons that came out of Iraq WMD mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for us to be it, to be much more clear on consequential judgments to make it clear just how confident we are. Um, President Bush used to ask me if folks from across the intelligence community are all seeing the same material. Uh, it, it was okay with him that we reached different answers, but he wanted to know why. So again, mm -hmm. getting back to that really hard thing of why you think what you think, mm -hmm. having to be able to come down to because I'm placing more emphasis on this source or past precedent, or I have doubts about whether or not that source is real. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to explain that to our policymakers. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Ken Decleva has a question for you. He says, thank you for doing this talk. As a senior analyst and former PDB briefer, how do you measure influence and how your assessments influence and or change the decisions and thinking of your customers like the president? I mean, this kind of, you know, you just mentioned a, a little yeah. bit of it. You started us down this pathway. So um, I had the um, privilege of serving seven presidents. I started with Ronald Reagan and all the way through our, our current president. Um, and over all that time, what I kind of developed is I think there are two key metrics uh, for us as an, an intelligence organization to understand how how well we are doing with uh, a president. And again, I'm, I'm staying away from that influence word because, again, remember, I said our job was to inform, not mm -hmm. to influence. Um, so and those two key metrics are how does the, that individual make time to interact with intelligence? Mm -hmm. And do they ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't have to do either one of them. Now, over seven presidents, they all take in information differently. So it's not about do they make time for a briefing or don't they, but do they interact? Do they read the PDB? Um, some might prefer to actually have a briefer there in the room with them. Some might prefer to read it, you know, over their Wheaties in the morning and then, you know, ask questions later, but they are making time for it. And then, as I said, the questions part, if they didn't care what we think, they don't have to ask us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. over all those administrations, um, I can tell you that we were able, to, all of them made time for intelligence and all of them asked us questions. So those are the big way I measure it. Uh, Tamson Shaw, hello Tamson, says the line between making policy and informing policy, which we've been talking about, uh, must be somewhat blurry, given mm -hmm. that you have to give more weight to some threats than others. So in doing so, do you, you have to decide whether to prioritize keeping the world safe for American values, liberty, liberal democracy, or threats to national security in a purely political realist sense. She's getting down to the minutia now of everything you decide uh, has, you know, influ is influenced by your thoughts, your beliefs, and, and you've got to weigh that in some way. How do you manage that? It's not easy. No, being objective is not easy, right? Every every analyst um, in the intelligence community has their own personal views. Yeah. Um, it's not like we become automatons the minute we walk in the door. Um, but what you have to understand is that um, your personal views, you have to set those aside when you are looking at an issue. So it doesn't become about, is it a good or a bad thing that something's happening in the world? It's just a thing, right? It's, yeah. you, so you are talking about that issue. Um, it's, one of the reasons I said it's really important for folks to understand what you do and don't do as an analyst at CIA is because if this isn't the right fit for you, then you shouldn't be at CIA. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in making policy, there are lots of places to go do that. So um, not passing judgment, and again, that's part of our review process and the coordination process, is to kind of weed out as people are writing to say, well, wait a minute, you seem to be injecting a, a value judgment into what you're writing. Um, let's get that out of there. Uh, mm -hmm. If And it's not about us ever saying, you know, we think that the best thing you could do in X country or is this would be if you want to have a particular policy, if you want to, you know, that they set the policy and we say, if that's what you want to have happen, here are leverage points in which that you could make that happen. Here are the best ways you could make that happen. Or if you do X, here's, we think Y is going to happen, which mm -hmm. is actually opposite from what you said you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so again, doing all that without a value judgment is really what our objectivity is about. Mm -hmm. Tracy Wilson has a question. Um, she says the CIA and the IC more broadly has developed a range of structured analytic techniques, primarily to sharpen and strengthen its analysis of current intelligence. But as you know, she says, there are also valuable tools for organizational strategic planning and these sort of over the horizon type studies. Can you say a few words about those sorts of applications? Absolutely. So, um, you know, when I became, uh, one of my jobs, I was the uh, head of our office of terrorism analysis. And um, when I took over there, one of the very first things I did was to bring together our senior analysts within that office and ask them to do some structured analytic techniques um, to try and figure out where we thought terrorism would be five to 10 years from now. 
because I was going to, and I said I needed to do that because from a strategic planning perspective, um, I needed to understand where we thought terrorism would be 10 years from now because I needed to start hiring and developing that expertise now. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, those kinds of brainstorming and structured analytic techniques are really important. You know, one of them that I really love is kind of the, the what if idea and how do you get to, if, if you wanted to have something, you wanted to say something has occurred, and pick your, your topic. Um, let's say, you know, uh, we were able to uh, stop the flow of fentanyl into the United States. Mm -hmm. Then what are the things that would have had to have occurred? You go back and say, what would have had to have happened to, if that, to make that goal real mm -hmm. and break it apart? And then say, okay, if now we've got the things that we can really start writing on and planning for, if you want to take those individual pieces and say, in order for that to have happened, we would have had to have understood all of the supply routes by which it's coming in. We'd have to understand what was going on with the various cartels, what was happening in China, what was happening. And you can really start for planning purposes and strategic um, development purposes, use those structured analytic techniques. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that I am, um, uh, I, I'm on my way into retirement. Um, yeah. So uh, by the end of June, I will have retired from the agency. And it's one of the things, this question is really interesting to me because I'm starting to really, in my own mind, um, start to try and understand even better how what we've done in the intelligence community is applicable outside. Mm -hmm. And I think that this strategic planning is a big part of that, um, mm -hmm. what, what's transferable. So you brought this up. <laughs> you're going to be you're going to be moving to a world um, full of open source intelligence and, and information that's coming to you sometimes from trusted known sources, sometimes um, via devices, depending on how you get your news and information. Where it's much more difficult to check or vet sources, which is one of the reasons why disinformation and misinformation are mm -hmm. so rampant these days. What are some of the things that you're going to be doing when you're out on your own trying to inform yourself on a daily basis with this array of sources, some of whom you might know and trust, and some you really don't have any idea who they are or what's driving them? Um, that's where I think a lot of the, the training um, of being an analyst is going to come in. Yeah. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to brag on my husband for a minute. Uh, my husband was a military analyst at uh, the agency uh, for many years. When then he he's since retired. When the war broke out in Ukraine, um, he couldn't help himself. He would I would come home from work and he would be he'd have maps out and he would be you know going. He was very into order of battle over the years. And on purely on open source information and his own expertise, understanding what are those questions that we should be asking? What are the things that need to happen in a battle? What are the kinds of things? that you know, we could be expecting the Russians to be doing you know, where the field hospitals would need to be, all of those kinds of things. So combined with the expertise, I would come home and he would be, he'd have gotten to 85 to 90% just on open source alone. Wow. And his expertise as a military analyst, right. the way he reads information, um, again, with that critical eye of saying, I don't have anything to back that up. Would I think that I would be able to see something um, mm -hmm. about that? Do we, should we really have an expectation that if this was happening, we, someone would have seen the field hospitals, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, and so I do think that I'm hoping that my own training is going to kick in and I'll be able to, um, to, to look at that from a perspective of, I, I just don't think we read the news the same way the average person does. Mm -hmm. um, as I said from the very beginning, we read it very skeptically. Yeah, but it would be very interesting to have a dinner at your dinner table with the, with the two of you, <laughs> just <laughs> how to how to think critically. I can imagine. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I'm curious. I'm curious. Um, there are um, some folks in the private sector who say that the agency and, and the IC in general could do a better job of institutionalizing the way that they're using open source information. I just yeah. wonder, you know, as, as we're looking at the world today, 
Um, what do you foresee if you were had to have to predict what the IC would be using or relying on or changes in the way that analysts are thinking about information or getting information five, 10 years from now? What do you think some of those major tectonic shifts are gonna be? So a couple of things. Um, I know there are a lot of folks out there who are talking about um, that there should be an agency for open source or there should be a more centralized approach to open source. I kind of take a, a counterpoint to that. Um, I would prefer, again, that the analysts have access to the tools um, and the methods themselves to be able to what I call wallow in, in the data. And again, this comes from a bit of those dinner conversations with my husband about order of battle. Um, so when you have someone who has expertise and they're really wallowing in that data and they, they have that intellectual curiosity to look and say, huh, never seen a tank up there. Wonder why there's a tank there now. Um, really start digging into that. That's where new insight comes from. Mm -hmm. And often that's the way I describe the job of an analyst. It's to create new insight. What I fear is that people want to move in a direction with open source in which somebody else is curating that all and delivering it to analysts. And what that feels like is very much going backwards. Um, again, when I started at the agency and we didn't have all of the search engines and tools, how we didn't have the internet, but um, <laughs> I, I recently went back through my own evaluation reports as part of my retirement and I was praised for being an early adopter of the internet. Um, <laughs> uh, but you would go to the library and you would ask the librarians, hi, I'm going to be writing a paper about X and they would do some searching with the tools that they have, tell you come back in a couple of days and they would hand you things. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was always the one going, what didn't you give me? Mm -hmm. Like, what did you curate out? And I don't wanna go back to that. I want the analyst to have as much access to that whole sandbox of information to be able to find the insights themselves. So um, I think that's my first point. Mm -hmm. The kinds of things that I think um, we're gonna find that you know five, 10 years from now, it's already happening. So, you know, we have imagery that is, you know, commercial imagery that is, is out there that you can um, look at. There's, it's so hard, and this is, I feel for our operational colleagues at the agency, it is so hard to keep anything hidden these days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's someone watching on security cameras and CCTV everywhere you go, all of, all of that kind of stuff. I do think it's going to be ever more information out there for the analyst. It's just gonna be figuring out how do I get to the stuff I really need. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll just say is maybe something you weren't thinking of, but it's the opposite side of this. How are we gonna disseminate the information once we get it? Mm -hmm. um, we're already working on things like, you know, virtual reality and having augmented reality and all kinds of things so that we can present to policymakers information in different ways. Um, now getting them to actually put on the, the the goggles, that may be a challenge, um, but we have to be ready when we have a policymaker that is ready for that. And how they take in information is driven by the press. It's driven by the outside world. Um, you know, it's already a question of do they want to swipe or, you know, do they want to toggle or do they want, do they want it on an iPad or white paper, all those kinds of things. So we have to be ready for that part too, like how we're going to deliver that information to them. Um, and so I was once asked, what job do I think um, will exist at the agency 10 years from now that isn't there today? And I have a feeling it's going to be, we already have a few, but we're going to be, need a whole lot more folks who are doing, um, you know, virtual reality and folks who are helping us through that kind of dissemination of our product. That's really interesting. And I wonder if, you know, because we're, we're raising now a whole different level of these digital natives, which we've said before, and I know that that's even an outdated phrase now I hear, but, but you do wonder um, how they're gonna be taking on this information and how it's gonna be most relevant uh, to them in the decision-making process. Um, if you had to um, sort of share some secrets, which I always love to say to anyone who's ever worked with a CIA, uh, for the private sector, um, when it comes to sort of analyzing and understanding just data in general, because data, it, as you said, I mean, we're wallowing in it, you know, whether you're inside the agency or you're not, what secrets or tips do you have to share about sort of 
sussing through uh, quickly all of the data and getting down to what's important. Does it, is it again just kind of driven by trusted sources or is there more to it? Um, I think there's more to it uh, than that, uh, because, but I think maybe one of the secrets that I would say is don't underestimate visualization tools mm. um, for data, uh, because I think that it's one thing when you are spending time kind of, you know, going through rooms of paper and so much of the data now is actually coming in and something that may not really make a whole lot of sense to uh, an analyst looking at it just, you know, it's a bunch of geo coordinates or something along those lines that was left on the cutting room floor at NSA or something. But yet when you're able to take that information, clean it up and help put it do a visual use visualization tools, it shows us all kinds of things that we weren't we were missing before. Um, so I think the use of visualization as a way to help um, put together um, I know it sounds corny, but to put together that picture that's mm -hmm. coming from those oceans of information, that would be a secret. I think we're we're finding that that's really helpful for our officers. Mm -hmm. um, the other is that idea, as I said, of being able to set some parameters about if you've done your thinking beforehand, what are really important things that if I were to see this happen um, would be important to me, whether it's if I see this handset coming within five kilometers of this location or whatever it might be, and how using the um, the technology to alert people to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can't all stay glued to our computers 24 hours a day. But if, you know, we already have done things where it's if you set those parameters, the machine will call an analyst at home mm -hmm. and say, now they can't tell them because it's classified, they can't tell them what they're looking at, but it's, it'll something you asked me to look for happened, you might want to come in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So awesome. help, help that. Yeah. The last thing I would just say on that is um, knowledge management. Um, mm -hmm. I, I used to underestimate that. The ability to go find what you've already said um, mm -hmm. is really, really important. Um, mm -hmm. Because coming back at some point, someone's going to, they will remember what you said. Um, and they're going to say, you changed your analysis, but you didn't tell me, or why did you change it or what? So being able to really understand where your lines have been um, is, is, is almost as important as where it's, where it's going. Yeah, and I, can, and I can see that really being relevant anywhere in the world today, whether you're coming from you know the CIA or whether you're running a multi-global or whether you're just sort of an average person trying to figure out what's real and what's not real. Yeah. Your feeds. Um, I think we're all facing some interesting complexity. So. My last question has to be, what's next for you? How are you going to sort of take some of this incredible experience over four decades, um, this ability to think in a way that more people on the outside of the agency need to think? How are you going to apply some of those skills? Do you know yet? I, I don't, um, but I'm really excited about trying to figure it out. Yeah. So, you know, I, it, as I said, it was almost four decades at the agency. and. Um, I would not trade that career for, for anything in the world. Um, you know, I got there, it was kind of serendipity how I ended up at the agency, but I was so fortunate that I did. And now when I kind of, kind of look ahead, one of the things is, is after that long, the, the job is hard, it's challenging, but I knew how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm really looking forward to is trying to use some new muscles um to as we were talking about before to try and understand a little bit better what goes on in the outside world um and see how that can apply so i'm looking at everything from possibly um maybe doing some advisory boards some other kinds of things to see how i might be able to help there uh, i it, it's still important to me to have mission um so i can envision at some point in time maybe doing some teaching so i can hopefully inspire the next generation um yeah. into this important work but yeah, I'm, I'm really right now just kind of exploring um, and hoping I'll oh. figure it out. Education and how to think are probably two of the most fundamental, in my own personal opinion, most critical things that we need to be sharing uh, widely with each other right now, particularly given the, the wide range of national security threats that we're facing. So we have just a couple of quick minutes and you know we always take like time to cover all the serious stuff, but I have to just ask you, uh, on the funnier side, like, are there are there funny moments that you know over four decades of things that have happened to you in your career that people would say, no, that that can't be true. Okay, I'll tell one because um, 
and I think I might have mentioned this to you the other day when we were chatting. Um, so I feel very strongly that the relationship between a briefer and their principal is something that there has to be confidentiality. So I did ask President Bush if he was okay if I start to tell a little few stories about him, and he said absolutely. So, um, and I recently was invited down to do a session at the Bush Center, and what I didn't know was that he was going to be in the front row when I told this story. But it was um, about the first time that I briefed him, and I think one of the things that's really important um, is that going back to this idea, and it's very similar to some of the things that you and I have talked about about the cipher brief, that it's not political. Um, so no one ever asked me who I voted for, or what my politics were um, before I became uh, his briefer. What he did want to know was whether or not I could, quote unquote, take the heat. Um, the idea being that he could be himself in front of me, he could ask hard questions, he could do things. So my um, second day that I was going to actually do my first briefing after having met him one day, I watched my predecessor do her briefing, then I was going to do it. and. Um, as I was prepping, and it was a lot like prepping for finals every morning, you're really like cramming it in, trying to figure out. His aide walked in with this box and mumbled something about it being toys for Barney the dog. Um, and we were actually down at the ranch in Texas and so out of the White House. And he puts this box down. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, I'm busy. I'm about to brief the president of the United States. Um, so I do the briefing. And after the briefing was done, the president asked me if I could get something out of the box. And I was like, oh, okay, you mean the one with Barney's toys? Sure. And I went and I opened up the box and it was rigged to have a fake snake jump out. Um, <laughs> so the snake jumps out now and I, I am not a jumpy person. So I kind of opened the box, the snake jumps out. I kind of turned over, I looked at the president and I said something to the effect of, sir, I think Barney got this one already. And I closed the box. And he got this little smirk on his face, never said a word after that. He walks out and then his aide, the one who carried the box in, comes up to me and he goes, what do you have, like ice in your veins? I said, no, I have an eight year old and you're gonna have to do a whole lot better than that. <laughs> and that was like a test and it was fine. So um, yeah, so there are lots of moments, um, lots of things happen in a career at CIA that you you aren't expecting and it's one of the beautiful things about it. Um, if yeah. you get good at your job, um, there, it's all about your competency. It's one of the other reasons that I stayed. It's not about your seniority. It's not about anything. It's about whether or not, you know, you're, you know the most about what's going on and you're the person who's going to get the opportunities. So. And so it's a great thing to achieve um, for anyone in their career um, and to chase after. And for more than four decades, um, Linda Weiskull, just want to say thank you so much. Uh, retiring as CA's deputy director for analysis uh, in sometime during the summer, I think you said the end of June. Um, yeah. And we are looking forward to keeping you on the Cypher Brief Radar. I want to oh, thank, you. thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who, who joined us today um, and for those great questions. Yeah, they were really good questions. Thank you so much, Linda. And for everyone else, um, really appreciate your time. I think these conversations really are just insightful. They share little glimpses into worlds that we rarely understand when we're reading the headlines. It's often always bad news. Sometimes it's really great to get a peek behind the curtain and see who these people are and how this information comes together and what these huge challenges are in trying to get it right every time, which we all know is impossible. But Linda Weisgold, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Take care.